Welcome to the Nature Advantage podcast, where we explore how we can become more distinctive by nature. As we become more habitually connected to technology, we become more disconnected from nature. Yet history shows many of the greatest leaders, inventors, and artists make nature a habit to find energy, clarity, and innovation. I speak to Grammy award-winning musicians, Wall Street Journal best-selling authors, business leaders, athletes, and living legends you may have never heard of to discover why making nature a habit has been an integral part of unleashing their potential and how it can help unleash yours as well. Are you ready to discover your nature advantage? Let's dive right in to today's conversation. All right, everybody. So uh, we're here in Booton. Booton. Did I say it, did I say it right, yeah, Mike? The, yeah, swallow the end. Booton. Booton, New Jersey. And yeah. it's uh, the end of February here, so it's a, it's a little bit cold, but I'm yeah. here with uh, entrepreneurial... The, the, the patron saint of entrepreneurship, as, he, as he's been referred to, be. Mike Michalowicz in his Office of Creativity here. At, it, it's Obsidian Launch. It is it's, Obsidian Launch, which is like a holding company for the Mike Michalowicz, me, stuff, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is my books, my speaking. Patron saint is uh, it's very kind. That was, that was assigned by uh, Simon Sinek, yeah. which was so out of left field, so unexpected. It gives me goosebumps still hearing it. Um, I don't know if I'm deserving of even something one one hundredth that term, but I feel blessed. The quick story is uh, I know Simon before he launched uh, Start with Why before he was an author, and I was just writing my book, my first book called The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, and we were collaborating in New York. He the space we're in right now, you know, there's a lot of brick behind us and stuff like this. It's in a basement. It's a little bit. There's a little bit of coolness down here. That's how his space was in New York, and we're getting together and. Uh, I said, I'm coming out of the book. And I was the cocky guy. I said, it's going to be a toilet paper entrepreneur. It's really in your face. He's like, yeah, I'm writing a book. And it wasn't called Start With Why, by the way. A lot of people don't know this. It was called The Golden Circle. He said, I'm coming out of the book. And it's going to be called The Golden Circle. And it's this concept. And it was a Start With Why concept, but The Golden Circle. And he's like, I'm going to pitch Penguin. And I'm like, oh, I'm pitching Penguin. I got rejected by Penguin. He got in. He got in because he got a meeting with Adrian Zakheim. He's the, the publisher. He's the president of the imprint. And they said, we don't take self-published authors. We don't take new guys like me, like Simon. He made such a passionate presentation that he almost felt empathetic or sympathetic and gave him the gig. The one thing that happened, Penguin says, we're not going to call it The Golden Circle. It's going to be called Start With Why. And that book has become one of the most impactful books of this decade, last decade, and maybe of the century. It is such a powerful, simple concept. And um, Simon, uh, sadly, I've lost touch with him. Uh, I think just because he's he's in such demand, he, he's inaccessible. I've reached out. He can't reach out. I, I reached out one time, just a, just a shot in the dark, saying, hey, listen, I'm writing a new book called Clockwork. I'd just love to get your support. Uh, and I sent a video of when we first met. I thank God I recorded that video of when we first met. I said, hey, remember this time? He got back to me a day later. He says, dude, I got your back. I got your back. He doesn't endorse books by rule. He backed it, and he, he said, I want to write my uh, the endorsement from my heart. And he said, you're the patron state of entrepreneurs, or you should be nominated as. It's unbelievable. That is unbelievable. Well, as a fan of your work over the years, and we've become really good friends over the years, um, you definitely, you, you were part of the spark of me personally becoming an entrepreneur when I was, you know, uh, collecting a paycheck, completely yeah. disengaged, not really loving my work. Yeah. So a lot of Thank the work, I, I, I read Toilet Paper Entrepreneur and Pumpkin Plan and tried to do that for somebody else's business. And, you know, it just didn't kind of go in that flow. So, so in that same vein, Mike, like when you really describe yourself, your work, what is it that you're doing? You know, just in, in just a couple sentences, like what is it that your big impact is going to be on the dent for humanity? So uh, I can say in three words, eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. That's my mission on this planet. And, you know, we're not doing a video or anything, mm-hmm. but this, I don't know if I ever show you this, this bracelet I'm wearing, this mm-hmm. little wrapped metal here, that says eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. And I keep it here for two reasons. One is it's on the palm side of my wrist, which means where the most blood flow is. So the visual for me is that my blood is pumping through this mission of mine constantly. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, a, it's a little bit of a bulk, so I hit it and I'm reminded constantly. The second thing is um, there's a book called uh, The Alter Ego Effect by Todd Herman, which is about owning an alter ego. Well, I was blessed that uh, uh, Simon Sinek came to me. He says, you're the entrepreneur's patron saint. 
EPS. So when I'm on stage, I actually turn this here, and that's when I go in EPS mode. It's no longer Mike presenting. Now it's the entrepreneur's patron saint, and I have to deliver on this. Wow. So yeah, it's, an, it's a mechanism for um, living into our purpose. When we take the field, this is what Todd Herman says, when we take the field, we must embody the character who we want on that field. But if we think that we're that character all the time, it's impossible to maintain that degree of energy and commitment. So my mission is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. My reasons behind it is because I've experienced it. Entrepreneurial poverty is when there's this gap of you start a business and people think you're wildly successful and the reality, and you know this, of the struggle, the hard work, the lack of money. And my mission is to close that gap. Yeah, and because I think, you know, for those that aren't entrepreneurs, it's easy to look. It's like, oh, that person's got 10 yeah. employees. Yeah. Life is great. They're they, crushing they must, it. They're crushing it. And they're making a million dollars a year because they had a million dollars in revenue. Yeah. But yeah. it cost them $1.8 million yeah. to run the business. So yeah. we end up having a lot of those uh, those sparks. Yeah. We're going to George and Martha's. If you oh. guys would like to join us. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you. See ya. That's in Morristown. See ya. Morristown is great. Okay. Um, yeah. So with that that whole piece, I, I don't think that people understand that there is an issue for entrepreneurs. Like that that that's an actual thing that, yeah. that needs to happen. Is is there a large population of entrepreneurs that you feel like that have do operate in that place of where they're in that poverty zone? Yeah. So it's, it's the vast majority. Um, there's studies, but I can't identify a source anymore, so I gotta mm-hmm. be very careful. But what I've heard is that 83% of small businesses survive check by check. Mm-hmm. Um, the vast majority of owners, here's the irony I start my business, you start your business, everyone listening to this uh, probably starts their business with two primary goals financial freedom and personal freedom. I want to be able to do what I want, when I want, and have control of my own life, and I want to get wealthy doing it, or at least live a life where I don't have to worry about money. That's usually the two primary focuses. And the irony is the two things we usually don't get are financial freedom and personal freedom. Right. So, um, and that's the vast majority of businesses. The reason I believe is that I call it the survival trap. Yeah. Wherever we are today in our business, in this moment, there is a way out. But there's, there's the most common way we take is the obvious apparent resolution. I, you know, we don't have enough money coming in. I need to make sales. Therefore, I'm going to run a discount today. Or I'm going to hire a rainmaker. And we take all these different actions. Well, if you draw the letter A on a piece of paper and put it in a circle, we call that your current moment, your, where you are today. An arrow in any single direction gets you away from A. But if you don't have a clear direction to head in, um, you'll find that maybe point B is on the right side of the paper, but you're drawing arrows up, down, and left. Sometimes we take actions in the moment to survive that take us further away from where we're destined to be our vision. So that's why most businesses struggle. There's no consideration for the future of where we intend to be. There's simply consideration for how to get out of the desperation of the moment. Got it. Okay. And oh, nice. So we'll just we're keep... Back. We're, we're, we're back. We're back. We're back. So with regards to that, Mike, like with the books that you've written, they've obviously been within that particular vein. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to ask you, so, you know, you've, you've written several books in this, this vein. You've got an upcoming book. Like, just give me a quick nugget. Like, what is Fix This Next? Like... What's that about? Because I've gotten the book. I've even gotten the yellow hard hat as yeah, part yeah, of the yeah, large yeah. team. You did I'm funny taking, pictures too. Right? Taking cool. I was told to take ridiculous pictures, so you did I well. did did as good as I can. Yeah, you did well. So, you did, yes. But you didn't go over the line, which I sometimes do. You myself. tend to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, the concept of fix this next is that the makeup of all humanity, mm-hmm. you and I, if someone looks at you and I next to each other, say, oh, they're different guys, different mm-hmm. skin color, mm-hmm. different body shape, different height, whatever. But the reality is you and I are about 99.9% the same. It's the, the human DNA, the makeup mm-hmm. in all of humanity mm-hmm. is basically identical. Yet we judge the outside skin. Well, this is true in business true and too. Mm-hmm. Businesses, when we look at businesses, we say, oh, they're all different. We're simply looking at skin. So what I right. determined is that 99.9% of business is identical. And what I did was decode the DNA structure of business and fix this next. I call it the business hierarchy of needs. It's a translation from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But basically, there's found five levels of needs, starting with the foundational need of the creation of cash all the way up to the, what's called the creation of permanence. And there's these five levels through it. And what we need to do, instead of aimlessly trying to fix whatever urgent and apparent issue presents itself, is to pinpoint 
where is our business's most vital need right now? What is the most impactful thing we can do to serve the business to move us toward that point B? And it's always going to be within this hierarchy. So this hierarchy is simply a system to navigate or pinpoint where we need to be focused right now and pay attention there. Most business owners, there's an action, something happens, and there's a reaction. And we run our business action, reaction, action, reaction. What I'm doing with business hierarchy of needs is action, contemplation, reaction. Action, a pause to evaluate, is this urgent issue really need addressing now? Is it going to have impact? Or is it something that can be pushed off? Is it within where my hierarchical needs are right now? So action, contemplation, reaction. That's what the intention of the book is. Fascinating. And your books, in many, many ways, uh, you, you talk about the, re- or the reaction, action piece. Many of your books have been based on getting entrepreneurs above the clouds, if you will, and seeing some of the bigger picture of what that is. That, you know, there's the talk of the mission, the purpose, all yeah, these yeah, things. Yeah. But then when we get stuck in the day-to-day, yeah. you see it hanging on the wall, but that's all it is, yeah, and it yeah. becomes white noise. Right. So you're able to actually make that connection in the work that they do to that mission in the way that they make the biggest impact. So I wanted to just ask you, what do you feel like in in your work that you've accomplished thus far? I believe in my our numerous chats that yeah. we've had in the past, I think you have at least 25 books in you. Right? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. That's like the, I think that's the low end number it, yeah. within you. But thus far in the cycle with where you're at, what do you feel like within the, within the, within the world of writing, within speaking, with all the yeah. work that you've done, what do you feel like? has been the biggest impact the one that you of say the books that, I've written yeah b- anything that you've done within within your world with, with books writing yeah you know profit first professionals what do you feel that that greatest impact the greatest been? impact outwardly mm-hmm. to the entrepreneur community has been profit first on a measured basis mm-hmm. that I get the most responses to that we know there's over 300,000 businesses that have implemented profit first mm-hmm. uh, and it's the most immediate impact because when someone you know, day today is not profitable, and tomorrow starts seeing profit accumulating. They mm-hmm. can see the immediate impact, mm-hmm. and many businesses are struggling with this with the system of profitability. So, profit first is a very simple approach that allows people to 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 channel profit out of their business by not changing themselves. And I think that's the key for all my books: is never ask the reader, the the entrepreneur, to change themselves because that's so hard. I've tried. I've been trying to change myself for decades. I can't do it. So, how do we channel who we already are? The greatest impact internally, I think, was Pumpkin Plan, because that was the one I said, oh my gosh, I can actually be an author. I wrote The Toy Paper Entrepreneur, and it was this kind of this, this sophomoric, irreverent attempt at being author, an author, but I didn't own authorship. When I wrote The Pumpkin Plan, I said, this is my destiny now. It, it all kind of came together with that book, like, I'm never going to stop doing this. So ironically, The Pumpkin Plan may be the greatest impact book, not because it sells most copies, but because that's the day I started to believe and now that was the spawn for all the work I'm going to do and have done. So with the pumpkin plan, it's it's fascinating because I've I've been a student of your work for a long time and as I, know, got, I I appreciate that. Yeah. I really appreciate yeah. that. No, thank you. Like, no, thank you. Like I oh, no, thank you, thank you, man. <laughs> no, fuck you, yeah, man. Thank you. Yeah, and this and see and if anybody actually does listen to this, this is kind of how we interact <laughs> yeah. typically in most of our actual in person conversations. Um, so the pumpkin plan, you said that that was a huge turning point yeah, for you, yeah. the day that you started to actually believe I am an author, where yeah. you, you, you began to breathe that yeah, in your exactly. life. Yeah. As I've looked at your work and been a student of your work and gotten to know you, Mike, one thing that's been really interesting, uh, we've been in mastermind groups together, yeah. we've done a lot of things. Do our wives have dined together. Our, that's our wives have dined together <laughs> multiple times, yeah. and we've gotten to hang out. But one of the things that I've gotten to know in, in, in working with you and in getting to connect with you you know, even in our mastermind groups, we'll get up and we'll say, hey, let's go outside and take a walk. Let's yeah, yeah, go yeah, yeah. walk if we're, if we're nature. booting. Did I say that right? You, you yeah, nailed, I nailed, say, it. nailed it right. You know, we'll go take a walk in nature. We'll go out by the waterfall uh, that's here in Booton. The pumpkin plan has very, very strong, like, it, it's, it's connected. The whole story is yeah. built on pumpkin farmers for people don't, that don't know and growing your business by focusing on the, the analogy of how do the farmers grow these giant pumpkins yeah, yeah. and then clockwork comes along later and you've had this queen bee role yeah, yeah, yeah. that's kind of come out how was it that your experiences with nature in nature have helped you to come to believe in yourself as an author or even find the nuggets of, of books so there's a term i actually didn't know i was doing this but the term exists it's called biomimicry and basically what exists in nature uh 
can be translated to our personal or business lives. And nature has spent, you know, she's spent a billion years figuring this out. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know the story of the, Vel- the guy who invented Velcro. Do you know? No. Oh. Let's hear the Velcro right, story. So the Velcro story. It's Let's hear it. So this guy, a uh, Swedish guy in the early 1900s, so it was like 1920, 1930, I think. He's looking at how to figure out how to make things stick together and peeled apart without getting sticky. Like that was his goal. And he's just contemplating that challenge. And he's walking his dog in the woods one day, comes back home, and there's burrs on his dog. He pulls a burr off, and he's kind of looking at it. He puts the burr back on the dog, and it sticks instantly. And now he's like, holy shit. He puts it under a micro, uh, microscope and figures out that nature's figured out this hook and fur system. Create hooks, it'll latch to fur, but it won't be sticky. So it'll stick, remove, stick it again. And that's where how he invented Velcro. It's a fur and hook system after nature. Wow. Wow. Right? Like, wow. Genius. So um, not because that story alone, but nature knows the answers. Mm-hmm. So why try to invent the answer? Look at nature. So in, in fact, every book I've written has been based by my biomimicry. Or this book called Surge. It was studying the movement of uh, waves, how dolphins leverage waves, but also surfers, and how, how they use wave momentum. So use the energy of the ocean to push forward momentum instead of paddling hard. Um, Profit First is based upon fitness, actually, regimens. How do we uh, control diets and stuff? So it was studying human, the human animal, but it was still studying what nature has figured out. Um, and and Fix This Next is based upon uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is kind of the, the human need structure, which is actually true to, to all animals. We first have physiological needs, then we have needs for safety and shelter, and then belongingness, community. And you'll see this in, in pack, pack animals and so forth. So biomimicry. And I encourage everyone to do that. Like, if you have a challenge, ask yourself, how's nature figured this out? And you'll be shocked. Nature has figured it out. That's fascinating. And how has that led in, into your own practices of, like, being intentional about time and nature. I know you're avid in getting outdoors, yeah, yeah, yeah. kayaking and doing different things like that. But has have you been intentional in your, your practices, whether that's daily, weekly, or just spending time out there or looking for different things? Do you look for different patterns or spots? Kind things? of, kind of. I, I repeat I notice that my my patterns to repeat things over and over again. When I go for a run, I will run the same route in one year probably if I, 50 times minimally and what happens is in the repetitions things start to become apparent it's unbelievable I, I thought I was manic at times so on Amazon I figured out a lot of hacks for selling books on Amazon that I present to other authors like how did you ever figure that out well I look at the Amazon page uh, for my own books five times a day for three or four years I've been looking looking and all of a sudden think little patterns that you can't see at first glance present itself in nature too I I will walk the same trail over and over and over again and it's on the 20th or 30th walk it's also like oh my gosh there is this rut pattern here what is this clearly this is an animal path like what's going on here and you start seeing oh animals uh, will follow a path that maintains a line of sight in the distance these must be not predatorial animals but prey animals Animals that are always position themselves at a peak area so they have the widest line of sight. Stuff I would never seen before until I repeat, repeat, repeat and start to see things. So intentional, I don't go out there saying, you know, I want to figure out how uh, animals leverage you know, different heights. I go out there to saying, what's, I keep on just walking the same path to say, what patterns do I see? And all of a sudden things start to reveal itself. Yeah, so, so the intentional piece is just making sure you're intentional about actually spending some time interacting with it. Is that yeah. fair to say? Yeah, but, but doing the same thing over and over. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of weird. Like, you know, I think uh, some, some people that hike say, you know, I'm going to walk a different path and discover something new. And that's, it works. I, I just naturally do the exact same thing over and over and over again out there. But then something new does present itself in a small space. It's funny, just another story. I was in Hawaii recently with a family in Lanai. My wife does, Krista. And uh, one day I'm like, hey, I'm going to go out for a bike ride. And uh, I rode to one side of the, the mountain, the, the bottom and row back up. And uh, I started videotaping on the way up, just notice to myself. And I said, I'm doing this because I want to sh- see what I discover as I go up. And my first thoughts at the base changed by the time I got to the top of the base. I said, because I'm taking a bike ride, I'm going to witness and experience more. And as I'm starting to go up, I'm like, this is a better experience. It's slower pace. Instead of driving down, I was on a road, you could race down and drive back up. It's a more in-depth experience. So I had all these judgments. By the time I got to the top, I said, I wonder if this journey is better than the ride. Because a few cars came by, and I don't know what the conversation was in that car. That could have been the most powerful conversation in the world. They, they could have sold world, world peace in that car. And I'm placing judgment that they're racing down a hill 
they may be having a more in-depth life experience than anything. So I, by the top of the mountain, I said, there is no better journey. If I walk it, if I bike it, if I ride it, if I fly it, no journey is better. It's simply that there was a journey that was made. So I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> well, <laughs> Somewhere. It, it's, Interpreted that, please. It, it sounds like... Just yeah, the, the the just the journey was made, but even where the environment of where the journey was taken, like, yeah, like like some of that. Because getting back to what you said, what was what I picked up from that with just you're walking the same path yeah. over and over. It's knowing that yeah, today I might not see something, and it might be the same for twenty times, and then all of a sudden yeah. I see the path. But it's actually that awareness that it, instead of getting caught on I have to do this and get this done right. This this is the parallel to the way that we live, oftentimes we're so caught up on the checklist that we have yeah, to have. Yeah, yeah. And I have to do this and I have to go through that we forget to just take a walk along the path and just allow yes. the, the, the elements to come to you. And that that has been like a hallmark of your books. Like the, yes. the it's what was it called? The bio Biomimicry. Biomimicry. Bio- yeah, so and that's been a part of your arc of your, your books. Yes. You know, another thing just enlightened for me is uh there is no wrong path. So what I used to do, I hear like an interview like this or something, and I'm like, oh, walk the same path over and over. That's what I need to do. You know, we just finished this mastermind upstairs. Yeah. I got, I think it's 20 pages of notes of things I have to do. But the realization is there is no wrong path. It's just get out there and do whatever. So the, the person that's walking the new path every day is is benefiting. The person that takes the car down the road as opposed to takes the bike is benefiting. Mm-hmm. But the person that takes the bike... So I, I think the lesson, maybe a lesson here is just because you hear it doesn't mean that's the right path for you. It's just walking or riding a path, period. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't know. But you know, it's funny, it's funny how there's kind of this yin and yang. So don't do what other people do because you have your own path. The same thing is let what other people do because they have shortcuts, right? So I, there's always this kind of balance. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That, that have kind of come together with you. What, what triggered for you that biomimicry? Because it sounds like from what you said with the pumpkin plan, when you finally believed in yourself as an author and then having read the toilet paper entrepreneur, there yeah. didn't seem like there was as much biomimicry in, in that book. Well, no, I mean, no, no. I mean, to an yeah, element to with, yeah, yeah. with running your business yeah, on yeah. three sheets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the premise of that. But like, was there something that triggered your path into biomimicry and, yeah. and getting to studying nature as having the answer. Well, what was it? Yeah, so two things. One is uh, I, am, I struggle with complex concepts. Um, and I don't... I actually, I, I went to a special, special education class as a child, and I don't even know what it was for. You know, but every, a lot of people say are dyslexic. I think I had dyslexia. I don't even recall. I had to find out what I was scientifically diagnosed as. But I had to go to special education to learn... Uh, how to handle complex stuff because I struggle with complex stuff. Um, so I really, in my head, when I hear something, some complex subject, I, I keep on kind of mashing it up, mashing it up until I can get down to, oh, now it's digestible for me. So that weakness has become a strength that I can take like this really heady concept of money and financial management and boil it down to a real simple process like profit first. Biomimicry is a, is a simplified version of what we're doing. So that's part of it. But secondly, it's very memorable. It's a, it's a memory technique. I know if I explain something that happens in nature, almost everyone can relate to it because we all can relate to nature. Mm-hmm. If I try to explain an esoteric kind of complex subject that can't connect with people, I, I'll lose them. So I know it's a connection piece. It's a, it ha- offers the two biggest benefits, nature. Simple and we all can relate to it. We, even if we're not an outdoorsman or, or an outdoors person, we still have an appreciation for nature. I think everyone does in a, a visceral relation to it. So that's why I think it works so effectively. Yeah. That's why I use it. No, that's, that's powerful. Um, no, that's, that's pretty cool. The, the queen bee roll was the hallmark of your book, Clockwork. That, yeah. that book came out in 2018, correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah, in August of 2018. <laughs> that's weird. Now it's weird, right? Yeah. You were right, and now you're a weirdo. Sorry. I was on your <laughs> it's lunch. It's too peculiar, yeah. yeah. You were wearing purple underwear that day, Mike. <laughs> actually, I actually, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> so I, I just remember it was in August, um, and I'll be the weirdo for that. The, one of the hallmark elements of that book was the queen bee role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you, you, you talk about that. Yeah. I'm wondering, can you explain a little bit about what that is, and more importantly, how you got that lesson of the queen bee role, because that, 
there, there was a moment that I believe that took place. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the, the became the birthplace of it did. the hallmark of that book. So the, um, the starting point, or, or the reason I looked into it was in organizational efficiency. I wanted to figure out what makes a business, no pun intended, hum along, right? What makes a business hum or buzz? And I couldn't really find, I, the first thing I do is I, I try to uh, reverse engineer successful companies that are efficient. And they, I couldn't find a common formula. So then I'm like, oh yeah, look at nature. And so you can consider a beehive an organization because there's there's many there's many units, mm-hmm. bees, mm-hmm. souls that are working collectively for the greater good of the organization, and so they run very efficiently. Now I, it wasn't like I'll say, oh, I'll figure out bees. I got stung, and uh, I I have a low pain tolerance. If I see blood in someone else, I start tearing up, and then if I if I see blood in myself, I'm like, ah, and I'll start fainting. I was out in I think it's that way. I was in my garden. And I'm sitting there, and so we have a small garden. I'm doing stuff, and all of a sudden, I thought there was a uh, rusty nail that slammed to my back. It was a bee. Hi- there was a beehive nearby. I backed into it. One of the bees taught me a little lesson. I started running and screaming to our porch. I never ran so fast. My wife is out in the garden. I push her down into the beehive, hoping they'll attack her. Young children, I'm elbowing them. You know, I kick my son <laughs> in the nuts. He falls down. <laughs> Save myself. <laughs> I did the antithesis of it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm rubbing uh, honey on the back of my daughter. Anything to avoid getting stung. And I run into our screened-in porch. I lock everyone else out so they're getting stung. I then look at this beehive, and it just impressed me the function, uh, what they're doing. And, and then I started to study beehives. Every bee is programmed to know that there's a singular core function that the survivability and thrivability of the hive depends on, which is the production of eggs. The beehive must make eggs because bees die very quickly. And the queen bee happens to be the bee serving that role, but she's not the most important bee. They all have equal importance. What matters the most is the production of eggs. So if the queen bee's failing to do it, she's removed, they spawn a new queen bee. If the other bees are unable to support bee uh, egg production, they're removed from the hive, everyone focuses on the eggs. And that what I determined is every business has a survivability, thrivability factor. I call it now the QBR. A core function, a singular function within our business that's the most important function for the operations of our business. Most businesses have no idea what it is and therefore it's not protected. But once you know what it is, if you protect it, if every bee protects it, and even those that are serving are protected, then the thing, the business will thrive. <clears throat> My own business, I ask myself, what's the most important thing we do? Now here's how you get it. First ask, what's the biggest promise you make to your customer? What's the guarantee you're making to your customer? The one biggest promise. For me, it's I make entrepreneurship simpler. My mission is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty, but my promise to my consumer is I'll make the entrepreneurial journey simpler. Okay. Once you know your promise, then you ask, what are all the activities that support that? And I do speaking, interviews, writing books, blah, blah, blah. Of all those activities, which is the one that most elevates that promise? It's writing books. And they better be effing great books. If, if I today say, you know what? I'm going to keep just ramping up the speaking, but F the books. I'm going to write shitty books and put shitty books out. Dude, everything's done. My speaking will wrap up. Like, you know, what happened to Michal is he's done. Um, but if I say, you know, screw speaking, I'm never going to do it again. No, no more interviews. All I'm going to do is put every ounce of my effort into writing extraordinary books. My effects on, on our society, I hope, will continue to slowly but consistently climb. What is the most important activity? And then protect it with everything you have. Devote your best time to that as an individual and ultimately your company protects it. So this morning, I was talking about it earlier, it's from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., I'm writing books. That is, that is the most productive time, uninterrupted, I'm writing my book. The rest of the time, my colleagues know, if Mike is doing work that starts compromising his ability to write books, we as an organization are failing. So every one of my other employees here protect that. Mike's got to write extraordinary books. Don't stretch him so thin that he's not writing great books. And if they see a problem, they got to start stinging the customers or whatever and protecting my function of, Writing great books. Wow. So this all came from gardening and getting stung, getting stung by being abandoned. Sacrificing family with everybody, my family. For, for, for them to, to go through that. Now, you've been an avid gardener for, for many years. I love gardening. I haven't in the last two years. We moved to a new house mm-hmm. and I, I have I found this fine spot. So the key to gardening mm-hmm. is you need consistent sunlight. Mm-hmm. And you've been to my house. Mm-hmm. It is a wooded area. There is no field. Mm-hmm. I found a rock ledge off the back of our house, which gets sun for just about eight hours. Eight hours is the minimum. You know, if you can get 10 to 12 yeah. in the house, I found an eight-hour spot. Mm-hmm. So now I'm, I'm have a, I am have a sun 
uh, device up there just measures the length of sunlight it gets. Yeah. Um, but I think I start a garden up there again. Awesome, man. Well, I, I have just a just a couple more questions, yeah. so, and and then and then we can wrap up. Yeah. But with gardening, why did you love that so much? What was it? What's um, been it's the hallmark a, of that? I think it's miraculous to see life from conception to death to watch that, and you can watch it in three month cycles, mm-hmm. right? So it, it speaks a little bit to the human journey, perhaps. Maybe that's part of it. Mm-hmm. Secondly, is um, it. It is a. It can be a meticulous process. I, I assume, like playing bass and stuff. There's a moment when you are so engaged in the activity that you have to exclude everything else, and that is a form of meditation. That is actually the definition of meditation. So playing bass at an elite level, like you do, is that gardening at an elite level, not like I do, but I've experienced just moments of that. Mm-hmm. You're so engaged in the process that you actually hit a meditative state. So that's I think the biggest value. And then the second thing is. Or the third thing is there is an end product. Like you make this musical score that changes people's lives. You can make, uh, I remember I made a fucking Peapod thing. Uh, this is how much of a gardener I am. A Peapod thing. <laughs> thing. Peapod thing. Uh, yeah. That was and a scientific name. It was a scientific right. name. Yeah. That, then my 10-year-old son walked out and I saw him pluck one off and start eating vegetables. Not because I said, hey, you got to eat more vegetables. And stuff. They just picked it off. Uh, snap peas we were doing. And my kids just started picking it off. And they, they started to... It started changing their lives. They had an appreciation for what real vegetables and fruit. I started growing strawberries. That was the best. That you just munch right out the vine. So that's why I think gardening has engaged me so much. I miss it now. Yeah. I and, need to get back to it. And with that, too, it really is interesting because elements of what you just talked about there, it seems like it's even framed into your appreciation for the life cycle of what you do. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, like writing is the lifeblood of the business. Like yeah, yeah. You roll, but you have to keep that cycle going because there, there is a cycle. It's going to go a... through. And, and if you don't keep that going, you don't keep that alive. And speaking feeds writing. Writing feeds speaking. But they, they all coexist, yeah. right? It's like our heart beats, but if we just stop breathing, then our heart stops yeah, yeah. beating. They, they all move in, in tandem with each other, but a, a lot of that applies to us here. And sometimes, as I was mentioning, we just get into as entrepreneurs, as business owners, even in just regular everyday jobs, we get so caught up with checking the box, right? Yeah. We live in such an execution centric culture. A big part of what I'm working on capturing is people like you that I feel like have attained excellence, but don't look at excellence as just a box to check. It's a highway that we've entered, and it's how do we sustain that. So the journey is the destination. Yeah. But understand the fact that there's real work that takes place in that. So, so with that, I think one of the final things I want to ask you here, Mike, is you've, you've made it very clear. You've been in, intentional, sometimes accidentally intentional, about making time to be in nature. Yeah. And, and, and just taking it in in some way. Whether it's just yeah. taking a walk in the middle of the day and just asking Maybe I'll see something today, maybe I yeah, won't, yeah, but yeah, I'm yeah. willing to yeah. do that and get outside because it, it sparks things in your mind. What are things that would be good reminders for people that can get caught in the check in the box, over executing and realizing that you know, they, can, they can spend some time in nature? Like, What would be some things that you would recommend for people to do? So uh, a couple things I have. So I have rocks on my uh, night table at home, mm-hmm. just ones I've collected. Just two or three. Mm-hmm. And when I wake up, uh, it's it's first of all, it's a physical thing. So when I reach out to grab my uh, watch that I'm charging, it's right next to the rocks. So I inevitably touch the rocks. And it's an instant reminder um, to get out there and just experience it again. And it's a reflection, too, because I pull from outside. Um, this is a little bit expensive, but this has been really cool. I bought a UTV, a toy. And a UTV is like a little mini car, but it goes down trail. It's like an ATV. I bought an electric, though. And the reason is, hopefully it's environmentally conscious. Honestly, the manufacturing stuff, I understand that that has an impact. But there is something amazing when you're out there and you push the gas pedal and there's no sound except the whoosh as you get out there. And now I have no excuse. It can be rainy, muddy. I used to think, I don't want to go out on the shitty. Now I want to go out on a shitty day, too, which is usually the best days. Because there's this miracle coming down when the, there's these these uh, streams that, at least where I am, dry up after two or three days of rain. But if you go out on the muddiest day, it's the most beautiful waterfalls. So my wife and I got out there. Um, so that's a great reminder. It sits in my garage just to get out there and do things. Um, and then to make it part of my routine. So for exercise, I run three times a week. 
I, I run outside and uh, it, it's, it, it's driving a benefit. I want to exercise and stay healthy, but I do the activity outside. And I've gone out there on some super cold days. There's not a single soul out there. Actually, this is a true story. Once I went out biking uh, and it was uh, zero Fahrenheit, uh, which that's tough biking. Um, some guy was driving by, slows down his car, and he yells at me, he goes, fool, and just drives on. And uh, he was kind of <laughs> right. He was kind of right. I was a fool. But also, I was surrounded by the, the violent sound of silence uh, just out there. And it was just, I saw the universe as massive in that moment. Um, so those are reminders. Just taking little pieces of the outside inside, um, having a toy to make that play, and that doesn't have to be an ATV or UTV, just making nature part of play. Um, you know, some of the best meetings, you know, you and I, we've walked around here, is movement. And, you know, it says to me we actually didn't move much, but but uh, one meeting we had, we went outside, we did this big loop around, we started playing on the play sets out there. We did. We started going on swings. the swings, and, 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 you know, one of the big ideas that came from that was, hey, Darren, uh... Would you play a solo bass piece? Yeah, that came out of that. That came out of our walk. We were by the waterfall and we just kept walking. You're like, we were just riffing on different things on music. And the idea came there. And, and you know, people, I, I know like I've heard like Mark Zuckerberg, he takes like walking meetings with yeah. people constantly. Let's get outside, walk. Steve Jobs was notorious for that. But there's something about that. And it's, it's a function of we can f- reframe the way that we think about work. Yes. Work does not have to be you're chained to a desk and a computer no. under shitty lighting conditions and all no. that. We can get a lot done by actually stepping away. Yeah. By stepping away, it can actually accelerate what it is that we want to get done. And that's, that's some of what it sounds like you're getting at. You know, I started this thing I called the Hike with Mike program. <laughs> and uh, it just was inviting people to go for a three-hour walk to talk. And I was actually surprised... How many people want to do a mastermind with me, and how few people want to do a hike with Mike? Um, I'm in for a hike with Mike. Oh yeah, yeah. So Let's do it. Let's we do it. can do it in the mud. I don't give a yeah. shit. Yeah, But it, it's funny, the conversations that come out when we're moving, yeah. but also this prejudice we have that that can't be work. Mm-hmm. That's that's something personal. That's something fun. Work is is painful, um, and I think we can, we have to blend those two things together. Yeah, there's a reframe that's needed, and that's part of the work that I'm trying to explore right yeah. now. Is that's why I'm studying excellence. Not you're an author. I'm studying authors, musicians, yeah, yeah, CEOs yeah. of companies, uh, you know, performance coaches. But I'm trying to just study what's the reframe that they had because it seems like even though they've attained and gotten on the highway to excellence in these different areas of life and for humanity, it seems I'm just wondering if there's a, a commonality yeah. in that. I know for me that was the birthplace of my own journey into at least attempting to get onto the highway for excellence yeah. because for many years I was aiming at excellent mediocrity and that's not where we want to believe. You but know. I believe that was excellence because of my framing. Work has to be this way. Nature was the birthplace of thinking differently. Yeah, I love in, it. In, in my own cycle and, it, and, it, and just so much of what I've seen in your work and getting to know you over the years, I've seen this constant theme, but we haven't really dug into yeah. into into really the the, the, the nature based pieces of it. So we moved. You you've been you've been in our house. So every house we've been to, my wife and I, intentionally but subconsciously, have moved to a more and more nature oriented area. Yeah, um, and it's been a subconscious but intentional. If that makes sense, like yeah. like we said, we're looking for something that's more us. I think that was the kind of terminology we use, and we've got more and more. Not remote, like we're actually in a very populated area, but in an area where there's there there's this immediate connection to nature. My wife just posted yesterday. She called it the turkey crossing. It's easily a hundred wild turkey that cross our yard every day. They work, they gobble up, and and I didn't. I don't know if you know this. They can fly. They fly. They can. I've seen it. Yeah, and they're they're big ass birds. Uh, we have bear come by, um, coyotes, deer, fox, and there's this res- this respect you have for nature that you know these animals can live in really harsh conditions where I'm sitting there with the the heater on and a merlot in my hand and I'm like ooh, ooh, and you you look outside the window and these animals move on unabated embracing nature um, there's lessons by just being putting your living how your body out in that environment you know and the, and the last thing I just want to share is uh I've been contemplating this and I'm saying enough now that it's going to happen is I want to go on a, not a I, was, I call it a silent retreat, but just 
a, a two or three days in the woods by myself. I, I haven't done it yet because I don't know how to do it safely. And that, you know, don't be stupid here. Um, it seems like it's relatively safe, but that's what I plan to do is just go somewhere safely, be out for two, three days and have no, no connection or nothing and just be out there and see what happens um, to learn. And one of the things, just coming back to that on the, on the edge of like the zero degrees and the sound of yeah. silence, the, the, you know, the violent sound of the silence, violent, yeah. silence is actually so abundant, right? Because there's so much noise that's going on in yeah. our world constantly, but underneath that, the, the bass soundtrack, if you will, for all of that, the canvas is yeah. silence. Silence. Yeah. And no matter what, it's always there. It's always present. You can never you can never turn it off. You fill all these things, but within the voids of what we do, yeah. there's, there's silence. silence. And that's what creates the connection and stories we, 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 we go through these. So embracing that silence is almost like for, for us in many ways, like entrepreneurs, for, for just different people, we we've come into a space in humanity where we think we got to do more we got to be more yeah, yeah. and there's the ne- next productivity hack and, and this and our friend chris winfield what he was a productivity specialist he gave up that's on a it. bunch yeah. of horse shit yeah. right yeah and he's completely shifted his script and moved off of that and part of the massive success he's achieved in super connector media has been creating space that's right you guys have become friends yeah it's yeah. unbelievable yeah he went from creating a space. struggling company teaching productivity to a company that's against productivity and makes I think he passed ten million dollars in revenue. It's just, it's just remarkable. Yeah. But speaks to that space. Yeah. Don't yeah. pack in more. Don't become impacted. Yeah. Give space. Yeah, that's that's what it is, and nature mm-hmm. teaches us that. And in, in I mean the the bear story, like seeing that. I mean, I'm glad I haven't been on your property. One of the, I'd love to see a bear from the window. You guys see a bear. while you're drinking the merlot. Like so, that would be good. But hanging out with the bear outside. Funny first bear incident. Yeah. I'm driving up. You know, we're a steep, up the steep hill. I'm coming up this hill. It was a snowy day. I'll never forget it. Uh, we were having a, it was right before Christmas, we were having a little Christmas party. I'm coming up the hill and all of a sudden I see this woman walking down the street in a fur jacket with this huge ass. And that's one thing in my head. I'm like, God, that woman's got a huge, I never seen an ass that big. And why is she wearing a fur coat in the snow? And I'm like, that's a bear. There was this bear kind of rumbling up the road, just walking. And, uh, that's how much of, you know. And that's what Mike thought of. Like, I, a woman in a fur coat with, with a, a huge, huge ass. ass. Yeah. yeah. Instantly. That's where my mind went. I'm like, oh, that's a bear. I mistook. A bear for a woman with a huge ass. Got it. Huge ass. Got it, man. Yeah, that bear must have weighed like a thousand pounds, so it was a big one. <laughs> right on, man. Well, as as we're wrapping up here, like where where can people find you, find your your stuff, and so, what uh, you're doing? Yeah, so my website's mikemichalowitz.com, but the shortcut, as you know, is mikemotorbike.com. Or maybe you don't know. But that's my nickname in high school. I've never driven a motorcycle. I have no interest in motorcycles, but it's easy to remember. So Mike Motorbike, thank God I got the domain, dot com. For instance, my website, all the books I've written, uh, I used to write for the Wall Street Journal, all these articles, it's all available. Click on Get the Tools. It's one email. You don't even need to subscribe. Just get it one email, everything I have in one shot. Right on. Well, thank you so much Boom. for your time, Mike, and sharing some of your practices on what's led to your, your journey as an, as an author and how nature's played into that. Really, really appreciate it. My joy. This was a really cool discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Nature Advantage and for subscribing and rating and sharing the show with anyone you know who will benefit by tapping into their very own Nature Advantage. The Nature Advantage is made possible by our three incredible sponsors, the Victor Wooten Center for Music and Nature, the Cure for the Common Life podcast with Joseph McClendon III, and 34 Strong. Be sure to check out information on our sponsors in the show notes below. We want to thank you for tuning in and we will catch you on the next episode. I'm your host, Darren Verasami, and leave you by asking, how will you collaborate with nature this week? I'm out.